come here to worship God in his sanctuary and you are the assembly of saints and we're here to worship God together the Bible says where two or more gathered in his name he is there in our midst and I believe that how many of you are gathered together in the Lord's name today raise your hand that says that God is here then so that's a good thing because where God is good things happen and that's exactly what I'm expecting so I'm going to ask you a question. Are you ready? Yes. yes. Good, good. You're going to hear that again today. So I, I, are there any announcements before we actually begin? Anything that um, I'm leaving out that it's not in the bulletin or needs to be said again? Any other announcements? Valentine's um, lunch uh, will, be, will be taking place on Valentine's Day. Make sure you sign up. We have a caterer. And we have a special dessert show <laughs> that we're going to do. And a lot of stuff is going to happen. So make sure you sign up in the foyer. <clears throat> and uh, we will look for you there. Okay. Anything else that I'm leaving out? No meetings? or We're good? Stand. Stand. Oh, the men, the men and women's walks of, of Emmaus is coming up. Give us the dates again, please. For the women's walk. If you want to expand your life as a child of God, I encourage you to look into that and be a part of it, as I have, and many of you have also. Anyone else? All right, let's get busy. Stand with me, please. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to be with us today as we worship him together. Father, we love you and thank you, God, for your peace. Thank you for salvation. I thank you for the good things, Lord. I thank you for all things. I thank you, Father, for your your, your control over my life. I thank you that you are in charge of all things. And God, I pray that I will be a good steward of the life you've given me as I worship you in this earth. And as this congregation joins with us today, we lift our voices and our hands and our hearts up to you. And I pray that you will be glorified, God. I pray that you will feel pleasure, Lord, in our worshiping and giving you thanks today as we remember you. In Jesus' name, God's children said amen. May standing, let's sing together. We're going to sing a song called Living Hope. Jesus Christ is my living hope. Amen. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope 
Let's read the Word of God together. This is on page 73 or follow with us on the screen. It is called Praise and Bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. So do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save when they're Spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. The Lord remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. For your God reigns forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Praise and bless the Lord. This is the word of God and it is true. Amen? Amen. Let's continue to sing to the Lord. All right, let's sing that praise. This is called Graves in the Gardens. Jesus is the only one that can turn graves in the gardens. I search the world, I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade, are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, 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 there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing. 
nothing is better than you know Now I'm not afraid Now I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Woo! Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valleys. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you, Lord. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you, Lord. No. What you do, Father? You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Sing it again. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's no better than you oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you lord oh, oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can again you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, 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 Give him praise. Come on, put your hands together. Amen. Woo. Praise the Lord God. Father, we praise you. We rejoice in you. I'm so glad that you were there. I'm so glad, God, that there truly is nothing better than you. Father, we worship you. We thank you, God. We give you thanksgiving for being the almighty and powerful God that we need so desperately. So we love you. We worship you. We rejoice in you. In Jesus' name, all of God's children, say with me, amen. And amen. You may be seated. At this time, we normally go into communion, but we're going to save that till later after the message today. So Paul, be alerted on that, brother. After, after the message, we're going to have communion. Um, but first, before we uh, move on in our, in our worship time, uh, I also want to ask the question, is there anyone here that you have a ministry moment? Before we bless the children, something has happened in your life where you have had the opportunity to take a stand for God and say something for him or touch someone's life or anything? Is there anyone 
Boy, that's, it, this is a loaded question. It is. Is there anyone that would like to say something about God, that, that something happened, a ministry moment, anybody? Okay. All right, I want to encourage you, as I often do, let's look for these moments. Let's pray for these moments and ask God to give you the opportunity to do something. I know many of you have done some things and you've, you've taken a stand for God. I have this week also. But I want to encourage you. Yes, ma'am, you can't stand anymore. Come on, come on. Come on, come on tell us. Come on up. Come on. Don't be afraid of up here, guys. This is a good place. Everybody, I want, I want you, as soon as she gets up here, I want you to give her a turn around right good. Uh, that's okay. Good. Give her a big smile, right? <laughs> Say they're with you. Come right over here. Good. I know. You, you're, you're uh, okay, I'm not good at this. I don't really know if it's a, what he called it. Okay. I'm getting out of my comfort zone this weekend to, to go visit my past, and I just need prayers. I'm doing what God wants me to do, and it's hard on me, so I just need prayers. Uh, let's do it. Let's stay right here. Stay with me. Stand with me, please. You're going back to Alabama, is that right? Now, Alabama's a good place. <laughs> I know God's there, all right? And we're going to pray that um, God will give you inspiration, that he'll touch you. And when you speak, the Bible says you'll speak as, as, as oracles from God, that your words will be apples of gold and pitchers of silver, Okay. Stretch your hands out toward her right now. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we, we engage in a preemptive strike on the enemy. Father, before she goes over there, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would be there waiting for her, that you would give her opportunities, and you would give her, God, favor wherever she goes. That they go and they see a changed life, someone that is righteous, someone that is redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray for opportunities, and I pray, Father, for your voice to come through hers. I pray that you give her the boldness of the Holy Spirit to do what you have called her, created her, and equipped her to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Hey, you really great. Well done. Well done. Great job. Amen. Beautiful. We never had a preemptive one like that. I love it. Amen. Come on up here. This that. is not an immediate um, ministry moment, but it's something that Kim's statement brings to heart really, really well. We talk a lot about Emmaus here, and we talk about a, Epiphany, and um, one of the things I want to remind Kim and all of you, when you come out of your comfort zone, when you witness and share your testimony with others, and Kim, that's your life, the life that you lead now, not that past. That past is your testimony, and when you share it with others, and when you go back and face it, it makes you stronger, and it makes those that you witness and give that testimony to. When we go into the Getting State School, and we give our testimonies to those boys, it's a life they've never heard, but some of them it's a life that they have lived, and they haven't heard it from people on the free. They haven't heard it from people like us that have gone through some things in their past that they don't want to remember, and by sharing it with the others and by facing up to it, you will help others. You're helping us right here today by, by coming up and acknowledging that you're facing it. Amen. Thank you, well said. The equips you to go into places like Gideon State School, and it gives you opportunities that uh, increase, maximize your potential for God. Well done. I, we, we've never had anything like that when you were saying... I want God to prepare me for what he's called me to do. That's excellent. I loved it. Beautiful. Well done. Anyone else? All right. Good deal. All right. I want to, oh, no, no. We're going to bless children. Children, would you please come down at this time? We want to bless you and ask God to protect you, be with you, to guard your life. I was talking to the confirmation class today. These children have an opportunity to obey God in great ways, incredible ways. And that's, that's to obey mom and dad. That's right, you're still, we're all children. <laughs> Good deal. Landon in court, we're in confirmation class today. Those of you who don't know, Landon. 
court. <laughs> These guys, they're not afraid to pray publicly. I'm so proud of both of you guys. And uh, you're, you're stepping your game up. Well done, man. Well done. If you ever need a, ever need a, a, a prayer, in public, call on either one of these guys. They do an excellent job. We believe that God loves you. We know that he does, and we know that he has a plan for your life. Here's, here's a way that you can do some great things for God. Now, this sounds very simple, but it is very important to obey mom and dad. When I was your age, sometimes I disagreed with mom and dad. I did. You know, I had my own way, had my, my own ideas and things that I wanted to do. But God told me, he's told me through his word, to obey mom and dad, and it says this, there's, there's a condition to it, it says, so that your life will be long. How many of you want to live long on the earth, right? Obey mom and dad. Obey mom and dad. Trust mom and dad, because God has given them the authority over you to tell you some things. And even when you say why, which I did a lot to my mom and dad, David, blah, 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 blah. Why? Big mistake, but I, I, I never could get past asking that. Sometimes you just have to trust them. That's what trust is. So that you don't have to say why. You can just trust them. I trust God. I don't understand everything God does, but I trust him. I love him, so I obey him. And that's how that you can make God very happy and your life can be longer and better. All right? Stand with me, congregation. Let's bless these excellent children. Let's speak this blessing over them together as parents and guardians. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, bless you, Jesus. I bless you. I bless you. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you. I bless you. Bless you. I bless you. Bless you. Bless you, Jesus. Father, bless him, Jesus. Very good. Bless you. Bless you, Jesus. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. The children are a heritage from the Lord, and we bless you, Jesus. Pray. Yes, Lord. And keep you, our precious children, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you love these kids? Amen. 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 Y'all may be seated. All right. Good job. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if you'd like to go and hear... A message in your own language, because I'm not going to speak it today. You can go back there. We want the children to be exposed to the worship of God, and they have been. Normally, they're exposed to communion, too, but because of today's message and where I'm going, we're going to do it afterwards, but there will be many other opportunities. Let me say this to moms and dads right quick about communion. Communion is a practice of faith. Children should practice their faith. We encourage children to participate with adults in singing, in reading the Word of God, and in partaking of the elements because we all partake communion by faith. None of us, none of us participate in communion by, by our knowledge, by our mastery of the Bible, of the Word. None of us. We are all qualified by faith, and that's it. The disciples did not know exactly what Jesus was talking about at the Last Supper. They knew what Passover was. They went through everything that, everything that Jesus was doing. But when he said, this bread is my body, he took the bread of affliction. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. They had they'd eaten many, many different breads, but this one, the bread of affliction, is my body. Then he took the cup, which they drink many different cups during Passover. He said, this cup, the cup of redemption, is my blood, which is shed for you. So they just took these things by faith, and God honors faith. And no one, no one has faith like a child. I think children are the apex when it comes to faith, and I believe that they should be allowed to practice that faith. You say, well, preacher, what happens if they don't understand what they're doing? Then it's just bread, and it's just grape juice. The Lord will never punish a child by acting in faith. Never, ever. So we want to encourage you to tell your kids. What I often say, they say, when should my child begin to take communion? Here's what I say. I, I, I believe this is, this is the way I practice with my children. When your children ask, it's time for you to tell them what it means. Don't say, hold on, hold on, you got to wait till you're 15 years old. No, no, no. When they ask, 
They have that inquisitive mind. I want you to tell them what it is, and I want you to instruct them, and then I want you to allow them to practice their faith. Why in the world should we give the devil until the age of 13 or 14 to have his way with them before they practice their faith? So I want to encourage you, even though the children have left, normally we are having communion and they're here, but I want to encourage you, when they ask, tell them. And if you need help, call me. But as a child of God that's practicing and taking communion yourself, you should know. If you don't know, then maybe you shouldn't be taking it. But a child uh, has a simple faith and they can understand and they can be received by God and be uninhibited in their obedience. Today I want to begin or actually continue a series called The God of Miracles. The next two weeks we're going to have messages on love which are going to be uh, very important. I want to encourage you to be here these next two weeks. Uh, I'm very much looking forward uh, to both of these messages that you're going to be hearing uh, the next two weeks. But today we conclude this series on miracles. And I've entitled today's message, The God of Miracles, Get Ready. You should, you should be in that state of mind that I'm going to get ready for the miraculous in my life. There is more to a miracle than a need being met. A lot more to a miracle than one individual having something happen to them or for them. Many dynamics are in play when God intervenes in a person's life. Because that's what a miracle is, is when divine intervenes with the mortal. When God gets involved, it becomes miraculous. In these dynamics, you are benefited directly. Others are affected because of God's miraculous work. God is benefited. So when you look at a miracle, it's win, win, win. It is a great thing when we invite God to come and be a part of our lives, to touch us, not just when we're sick, not just when we're in trouble, not when we're, our finances are down, not just those, but to invite God to come in and perform the, the miraculous in your life. I think it's a miracle when we take a stand for God in public. I do, because it's difficult to do that. It's difficult to just throw yourself out there and say something, quote, religious to, to other people. Most people, they say, oh, we don't need to talk about politics or religion. You just need to keep that quiet. No, we're not supposed to keep our faith quiet. We're to be bold in our faith. Let's go to Exodus chapter 14. Man, we got a lot to cover, and I think I can do this. Ex chapter, chapter 14, we're going to begin reading through verses 1 through 4. Then the Lord said to Moses... That's a great start, isn't it? That's a great start to a miracle when God speaks and man is listening. Did you know that God speaks to you often? He does. But often we don't have ears to hear what God said. Jesus said, let those that have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. God is always speaking to his people, to people of faith. How many here today you say, I'm a person of faith? Raise your hand. Yep. God speaks to you. Whether I hear him or not is dependent upon me. So the Lord speaks to Moses and he says, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Hiroth. Now listen very carefully. That's a, that is a location. That's a geographic location. God tells them, go there between Migdal and the sea. Get more specific. I want you to be right here. <laughs> tell the Israelites you need to go right here. They are to encamp by the sea, and we're going to be even more specific, directly opposite Baal Zephon. So God is giving specific instructions as to where the Israelites are to go. They come out of Egypt, Pharaoh is about to pursue them, and they're about to go against the Red Sea. But God wants them right here in front of the Red Sea. Now Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. He's going to cause Pharaoh to do what Pharaoh's going to do anyway quicker. And he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself. Remember that, that I said that God benefits from, from your miracles too. I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. This is very, very important. And we understand when God gives us, number one, you got to listen. you got to hear him. And then God's going to give you specific instructions. He's going to give you landmarks. 
He's going to be very direct in what he wants you to do. Because this is going to set up the miraculous. Same as Jericho. We talked about this, I think it was last week, about Jericho. As to what happened. And that God said, I want you to do this. I want you to do it seven times. I want you to blow the horns. I want you to shout. He gives them specific directions. And then when the walls come down, I want you to do this and such. God's always going to be very specific because he's getting you ready for the miraculous. We need to be ready for the miraculous. God has given you and I instructions. So the question is, are we in position? Have we positioned ourselves for the miraculous? I talked to your children just a minute ago by one of the key ways to be in a position for the miraculous. That's to obey and honor mom and dad. If you want to position yourself for God's favor and his blessings, do what he said. It's very clear what he has said. He said it over and over. He's put it in print. It's preached everywhere across this earth. God has spoken to us, but we get ready. We position ourselves through obeying what God has said. Very important. If Israel hadn't done exactly what God had said, I'm going to propose to you there wouldn't have been a rolling back of the sea. I think it is very crucial that we do exactly what God says us to do, tells us to do. And it is also very important that we put ourselves in position. Let's go to some scriptures. We're going to go through, we're going to just really bum rush some scriptures. Let's go to Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is a key to a miracle in your life. Let's go to Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all of your strength. That is a key condition of us placing ourselves in position for a miracle. Let's go another one. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Follow God's example. You want to position yourself for a miracle? Be sensitive to what God has said and follow him. Matthew 6, 33, you know this, but seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Understand what God's will is. You can absolutely know what his will is. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray continually. King James says, it says, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. Remember the previous scripture? This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you want to know what God's will is, look in his word and he will tell you. Rejoice always. Pray continually. It's important. And give thanks in all circumstances. 11 o'clock every day, what do we do? We give thanks. Amen? When the alarms go off, we thank God. We stop where we are. We close our eyes or we look straight ahead if you're driving. We say, thank you, God, for being God. I thank you that you love me. Thank you for redemption. I thank you for the things I don't even know about. I appreciate you so much. I put you first in all my life today. I give you thanks. Let's go to Psalms 37 and verse 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalms 34 and verse 3 says, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We've done that today. You've come to the house of worship. You've assembled together with, with, with uh, the assembly of believers, and you've prayed, you've sung, you've read God's word together. That is an obedience to what God has told us to do. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 says, don't give up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, or as King James says, the assembling uh, together, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Don't forsake the house of God. You've not done that. You're here today. God love you and God bless you. You've put yourself in position for the miraculous. God has said, go here. You said, okay, I'm going to go right here. I'm going to look across the, 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 the sea. There's a landmark. There's a landmark. There's a landmark. This is where God told me to be, and that's where I am. This says I'm ready for the miraculous. When you obey God and you're sensitive to what he has said, you put yourself in a position and you get ready for God's deliverance. It's Exodus chapter 14, verses 5 through 9. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh 
and his officials changed their minds about them. And he said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. Egypt was the apex military. They were the world power at the time. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses, chariots, horsemen, and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Hiroth, opposite baal Zephon. Fascinating. He comes upon them, and where are they? They are exactly where God told them to be. A key point in the miraculous in your life. Do as you're told. Be where he's told you to do. And be about his business. That's very difficult to do that sometimes. It can be very troublesome for us to do exactly what God's told us to do because we got to get through our own comfort zones, as we heard this morning. we got to bore through some of these things that hinder us and stop us, which is in our own flesh. But when you defy that and push through and go where God has told you to go, it's very, very important because you have become exactly where God has put you. Now, watch this. The enemy is not just going to let you go. He's not going to just stop paying attention. The enemy will oppose your, your miracle. The last thing he wants is for you to operate in the will and the power of God, especially where God will be glorified, others will benefit, and you'll experience your miracle. That's not his will. The enemy will oppose you. Let's go to, to Exodus 14, verses 10 through 12. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified, should have been. I would understand that. And they cried out to the Lord. Now understand this. They were right where they were supposed to be. They obeyed God. They were exactly, they saw the land, landmarks were lined up. They were right where they were supposed to be. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us here to the desert to die? That's called griping, murmuring, and complaining. And it's in all of us. It is in all of us. How many of you have ever, ever been in a situation where you've griped like that? Have you? Yes. We've all been there. We've all done that. I shouldn't have given that money to that person because now what am I going to eat, Paul? <laughs> that was stupid. I should have waited till I got a raise and then helped that person with their need because I need to. Murmuring complaining. It's important for us not to gripe and complain when we're right where God has sent us. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? What have you done to us? They have an object of their, of their, their, their problem and it's with Moses. What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? They're also speaking against God too. I told you that the devil is going to oppose you, but so are you. Your own flesh is going to oppose your positioning with God and your miracle. So you can count on the devil opposing you, and you can count on your flesh opposing your miracle. It's going to happen. Don't be surprised when it happens. It's part of the process. But here's the thing. It ain't over. Let's go to Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. So it says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. He's a good shepherd. He's a good leader. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Now, if I was one of the Israelites, I couldn't have said, well, right. They're going to run me through with an arrow. They're going to, they're going to spear us. They're going to impale all of us. And I won't see them again because I'll be dead in the desert to be buried out here in the sand. And then he says, the Lord will fight for you. Oh, you need only to be still. Shh. Hush. That's part of being still. Not just a statue. 
a, fr a phrase that, that you could also use, and the kids are gone. Shut up. Hush. Shh. Well, my dad, and I'd start getting upset with an instruction my parents gave me, and I'd start talking. I'd, I'd say, I'd start to say something, I'd go, mm -mm. shh. My brother would be over going, <laughs> be still. God's going to deliver you. Why? Because you have positioned yourself exactly where God told you to go. When Pharaoh's army came up, where were they? They were exactly where God told them to be. They didn't know what had been prepared. They didn't know what was out there. They didn't know what was going to happen. They thought Israel was standing there randomly on the banks of the Red Sea, vulnerable, ready to be picked. They had no idea what was about to hit them. But they were exactly where they were supposed to be. And although they were trying to oppose their miracle, Moses, God speaks to Moses and says, listen, God's going to do the work for you. God's going to, to do this. All you've got to do is be quiet and be still. Exodus chapter 14, verses 15 through 18. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? <laughs> that tells me that Moses was saying the same thing. Moses was frustrated. What am I supposed to do, God? What's going to happen here? And God basically tells Moses, stop. Shh, shh. Listen, be quiet. Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea. We talked about this last, last week about the raising of the hands. It often precedes a miracle. Because when you start raising your hands, you're getting through a level of your flesh that doesn't want you to do that. It says, raise your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to raise my hands and I'm going to, we think we have to do things. How am I going to do it? I'm just going to wavy, wavy, wavy. He didn't have to do any of that. God just said, raise your hands and raise your staff. I'm going to do the work. Because that, that's what it is, a miracle when he takes over. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and through his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Yeah. Yeah, they knew it. They knew it right before they were killed. They knew that God was the God of Israel. So we have God's intervention. God set them exactly where they're supposed to be. Now it begins as we continue to obey God. Because God's intervention is always for his glory. In John chapter 9 and verse 13. Let's go there. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. This is Jesus walking. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Why is this guy blind? Was it his man or, or, or this man or his parents? That he was born blind. Why was he born blind? Neither this man, Jesus says, nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. What if your trouble, your sickness, your circumstance is there so that God's glory can be displayed in you? John chapter 9 verses 6 through 12. It says, after saying this, he sped on the ground. He made some mud with the saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes. Well, that, that, that miracle always troubled me. Seems like that would hurt, doesn't it? To spit, made the mud, and then put it, rub it in your eyes. Because, again, Jesus could just wavy, wavy, couldn't he? Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. What's he doing? He didn't say, that ditch over there, he said, here's a pitcher of water. Jesus is giving specific instructions to this man. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? All their lives they'd seen this guy do this. Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I'm the man. It's me. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, 
and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know. The man was not a spiritual giant. He wasn't a theologian. He wasn't a Pharisee. He wasn't a doctor of the law. He's just the man who said, okay, I'll do it. I'll follow you. I'll do what you're telling me to do. And thus so, he positioned himself for the miraculous. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. And the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, remember, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. Isn't that miraculous? Now, these people have been seeing this. They've been following this huge cloud by day, which gave them shade and comfort. And at night, they follow the fire, which also gave them light and warmth. So what happens now is they're positioned right. They've obeyed God. They've done some murmuring, complaining, but God said, hush. So they hushed. Now you begin to see God moving. He withdrew and went behind them. He was in front. The cloud was in front. Now the cloud shifts, moves around, and goes behind them. Now, the Egyptians are watching this too. Something's going down. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind them. Coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel did this cloud. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. Cecil, is it uh, DeMille? You know, in the Ten Commandment movie? That was in broad daylight. But we see here, this happened at night. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it in confusion. He throws the entire army into confusion. They're in the middle of the sea. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. Good idea. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And at daybreak, this was it, 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 all night long. But at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. Again, Cecil B. DeMille. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The, 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 the director of the movie Ten Commandments. Come on, show your age. Come on. All right. <clears throat> I remember watching that with my family <clears throat> on that Zenith black and white television. <laughs> and <clears throat> there's Pharaoh on his chariot on the other side of the sea. With the horses rearing up, he's watching it. And I remember my dad saying, no, 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 no. That's not how it happened. Pharaoh was out there too. Every single one of them were drowned in the Red Sea. The Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on the right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, they trusted, they believed, they respected the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. And what I'm leaving out, Miriam, the sister of Moses, who was in ministry with her and her brother Aaron. 
Miriam, Miriam takes out a tambourine and leads in a mighty, mighty praise and worship service on the other side. That's where she began to sing the horse and the rider have been thrown into the sea. Oh, my goodness. They sang and they sang. And as, as they led, they rejoiced and had a righteous party. There were no kegs or no coolers at that party. Amen? Because God had done something incredible. The children of Israel obeyed God. They positioned themselves exactly where God told them to be. Have you positioned yourself? Am I positioned? Have I done what God has told me exactly? You and I, we serve that same God who has not changed. Scripture says, he speaks, he says, I change not. Same God. He's given you and I directions. So let's position ourselves for God's glory. Let's get ready to see what God is going to do in our midst. So again, position yourself. Do what God's told you to do. If you don't know what that is, guys, you've got to read this. We're going to introduce a program for us to read this through in one year. We're going to do it together. We're going to read the manual into what it says. I was talking to the confirmation class today. Don't worry, guys. I'm not going to give it away. But we, we're talking in confirmation about the devil and the original sin and what happened. What most people, their image of what the devil looks like this. And God's word says he looks like this. Do you know the difference? Scripture has told us. Scripture tells us everything we need to know to position ourselves for a miracle. Now, I know people who weren't saved. They weren't righteous. They weren't godly at all. They were terrible sinners that God performed a miracle for. God will do that. He will do that. He's not limited. But you and I put ourselves in great position when we go where he told us to, do, to go. Look at the landmarks. Be exactly doing what he's told us to do. Shh. Hush, he says. Not you, sweetie. <laughs> he tells us, hush. And we be still and we see the glory of God. A lot of people believe that miracles have ceased because they don't see many anymore. It's just not true, guys. It's either God is faulty and he's not as powerful as he used to be, although he said he changed not. He even said, greater things will you do than I did. Jesus said this. He's talking about us. It's either God has lost his power or his resolve or his will or his love for us. Or we're not in proper position. We're not obeying God like we're supposed to. I submit to you the latter. I submit to you it's us. I think we're the ones that are out of position. God said, go over here. We said, okay, uh, that'll, be, that'll be fine. This is good enough. How many times have I heard a Christian say, this is good enough. This will be fine. I know God said to do that, but this is good enough. Good enough is the enemy of excellence. Do what God told you to do. Position yourself. Get ready for God to perform the miraculous in your life. Your need will be met. Others will be affected. And God will gain glory. When, when, when. It's amazing what happens when we obey the Lord and do what he has told us to do. Forsake yourself. Submit to him. The Bible says he will direct your paths. Don't lean to your own judgment. Trust him. Even when it doesn't seem to make any sense at all. Even when you're afraid and you see the dust of the enemy coming towards you. Stand still. Be quiet. And see the hand of God. Let's get ready. We're going to begin that by having communion together. We're going to remember the Lord and what he's done in our lives. We're going to respect him. We're going to believe and trust him. We're going to speak with him and to him. And make sure everyone has one of these. Does anybody come in and you didn't pick up one of these? In the, yeah, make sure you give. I'm going to give you some time to get it.
Okay. They're right there in the foyer in the little basket. We'll, we'll wait. We're going to get ourselves in position. Amen? I'm going to let you get in position. We'll wait. We'll be good. We're going to place ourselves where God has told us to place ourselves. And we're going to remember what he has done for us. We're going to love him. We're going to respect him. We're going to pray to him. We're going to commune with him. This is what we're going to do. Amen. The Bible says on the night that Jesus was betrayed, it said he broke bread. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Again, this was the bread of affliction. He said, each one of you eat. Oh, I'm good with that. Stand with me, please. Stand. The Lord won't mind if we give him thanks. Do you agree? My alarm's about to go off. Let's give him thanks. And I want you not just to listen to this preacher. I want you to thank God. Would you do it with me? Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your protection. I thank you, Father, for loving me. I thank you, God, that, that you are in charge of all things. I don't put my trust in politics. I don't put my trust in parties or anything else. My trust is in you, and I love you, God. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for giving me a home in heaven. Thank you for intervening in my life and giving me miracles. I love you. I give you thanks. I remember you today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. After he ate the bread, he took the cup. He said, this is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you drink this, remember me and drink ye all from this cup. The cup of redemption. This is the cup that he said, this is my blood. And the disciples... Not sure exactly what that meant. They knew about Passover. But they did it in trust and obedience to the Lord. You know what they did? They were still. And they worshipped. And did exactly what God told them to do. Let's be still. Let's remember the Lord. And let's be obedient to him. Let's position ourselves. Right across from Migdal. Let's position ourselves for a miracle. If you would please... Take the top off of your cup. Let's reveal the bread. I want you to hold it. We're going to do two things before we take this bread together. First thing that we're going to do, the Bible says, before man receives communion, the Lord's table, let him examine himself. Again, positioning. Let's examine ourselves. You may have sins or a sin that you're hiding from other people, but you can never, ever conceal it and hide it from God. He sees all, he knows all. What we're supposed to do is to confess those sins, repent of those sins, admit that you need help. And we've asked God to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's do that right now. While you're holding the bread, the bread of redemption, let's ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins. Father, I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you that you have pardoned my sins. I accept and receive that. And God, I admit that I'm not perfect. Only your blood makes me perfect. But God, help me to live a righteous life. I confess that I need help and I need your intervention in my life, the miraculous. So Father, please forgive me of all my wrongs. Cleanse me of all my sins. Wash me, make me new. Prepare me, Father as I get myself in position for your table. Thank you, Father, for forgiveness. I love you for that. In Jesus' name. If you ask the Lord to forgive you, say amen. Now, as the Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer says, forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Equally as important. We don't just ask God to forgive us. Now we become imitators of Christ. As he forgave me, I forgive the ugly people in my life. I forgive the abusive people in my life. I forgive those who have wronged me, who betrayed me, who have stolen from me, who have disrespected me. Because I've done all that to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Welcome back, kids. Good to see you. 
I've done all those things to Christ. Yet, while I was still in my sins, the Bible says he died for me. Paid the price for my redemption. So, in turn, imitating Christ, by faith, I'm going to forgive people. I don't know that I've ever forgiven someone out of a pure heart or a perfect heart. It's always been through faith. He said, preacher, I'm still mad at them. What they did was wrong. Well, the Lord knows that. He also knows that about you. You share that in common with your oppressor. Yet, he still forgave you. So, this is a ministry moment. I'm going to forgive someone for what they've done to me. I'm going to release them. Boy, that would be a great ministry moment, guys. Come on. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? I forgave this or that person. You don't have to call my name. God gave me the grace and power to let them go, and I did. That encouraged me. Now, in your most holy faith, I want you to forgive now. Bow your heads with me. And I'm not going to say anything until I've done it quietly. Then I'm going to pray with you together. I feel led of the Holy Spirit to do something right now, and I'm going to do it. Just as Moses lifted his hand and his staff over the sea that parted, I want you with me to lift your hand and your staff over the unforgiveness, over the offenses, of the abuses in your life. Let's do it. Let's do it together. Raise your hands over that sea in front of you. The offenses, the betrayal, the abuses in the name of Jesus. We forgive God. We release those sins off of our life. We put them on your ample shoulders. I forgive. Say with me, I forgive. I forgive. I forgive. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You're going to see the bodies of the unforgiveness on the seashore. As we forgive, let go and release these, these offenses. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we position ourselves. We see the landmarks, the sea in front of us. We position ourselves for a miracle. In Jesus' name. Stand with me, please, across this room. I want us to read the Apostles' Creed, which is a profession of our faith. Join with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hallelujah. We speak this into this environment. We want the enemy to hear what we just said. We want our flesh to hear what we just said as we confess that Jesus is the Lord of all, the Savior of my soul, and preeminent in this universe. I believe and I thank you, Lord Jesus. I love you. Amen. Take the bread together. Hold it up in the, in the air with me. We bless this bread. We thank you, Father, for giving us life and causing us to be a part of the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake the bread of affliction together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, turn your cup over. Take off the other side. When you do that, hold up the cup 
of redemption with me. Where he said, this is my blood shed for you. Heavenly Father, I receive and accept this sacrifice that cleanses me from my sins and keeps me. I thank you, Father, for standing in the way of myself and my own destruction. So when God looks at me, he sees your purity, your righteousness. I am redeemed by this blood. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Jesus said, drink ye all from this cup. Let's drink together. The fruit of the vine. The blood of Jesus Christ. That washes, cleanses, and sanctifies. Father, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You may be seated, Brother Paul, if you'd please come. He may ask you to stand right, right back up. But we're going to sing a song together. Get too comfortable. Go ahead, let's stand again. Let's sing Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, I will never let you go. Taking me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you, I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You're taking me from the miry clay set my feet upon the rock and now I know I love you I need you though my world may fall I'll never let you go my Savior my closest friend I will worship you until the very end until the very end until the very end Ooh. hallelujah amen. amen being redeemed and saved by the blood of Jesus means that when I die and I stand there facing death I stand there facing the endless abyss of, of what's in front, that sea, because I position myself by the blood of the Lamb, that sea of death parts, and I walk through on dry ground. Amen? How many are you ready for that? Are you ready? I'm ready. Amen. Praise the Lord. Raise your right hands one more time. I want to bless you, little children. You are from God, and you have overcome them. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is the word of God I bless you with in Jesus' name. Go with God and the power of his might. Have an excellent day. We'll see you next time. God bless you. You are dismissed. Amen? Amen. Well, now that worked out just great. Didn't it? Well, I, did, I didn't do it.